May the Lord prosper all of you who are in Christ Jesus. David Williams with Jesus Ministries. And in the event that any of my beloved family members happen to come in or out of this setting, please do your very best to stay focused. Okay, so this matter of participation. This matter of participation. Why does God demand holiness? Why does God demand holiness? I put a post up a few days ago about uh, asking you, the audience, to evaluate a, an, an image that we are seeing very frequently in our day. The Spirit of God said to Jeremiah that the false prophets are uh, strengthening the hands of evildoers so that they don't turn from their way. So, the t-shirt was a, an expression of what we are coming to know as modern day Christianity, which is a merger of godless culture. So, godless culture is merging with Christianity more so, more so. This is one of the ways that we know that Jesus is coming back to judge the nation in which we live. That's one of the ways that we know that. We know that Jesus is coming back to judge the nations. And when we talk about the return of Jesus, we are not only talking about the physical return of Jesus. We are talking about what Jesus described as a time of visitation or what the prophets describe as the day of the Lord. In one sense, God is talking about when Jesus actually returns to the earth. In another sense, we're talking about when God judges a city, an area, a, a nation where he will send widespread war, widespread violence, widespread famine, widespread disease. That's what that's talking about. All right. So the return of Jesus as opposed to the judgment of the Lord on a city, on a nation. All right. The Lord promises this church in Revelation that's located over in Asia. The Lord promises this church that their faithfulness will permit a major hedge of protection. So your faithfulness to God, your commitment to his service, your dedication to his likeness will protect you in a very, very great, great way, unless it's time for you to leave this life and to enter into the next life. So you are promised, God is promising you that your faithfulness will secure you. It will guide you. He's saying that his spirit on your life will guide you and ensure that there are things that you know that will keep you from the danger that others are going to be subject to. There are some things that you won't be able to escape. There are some things that we have to go through. There are some kinds of suffering, some levels of suffering that we have to go through. But as I've said in times past, if that level of suffering is uh, 20% of what you would experience. If living your life in disobedience guarantees you a hundred bad circumstances, a life of faithfulness will mean that, okay, well now you only face 20 bad circumstances. I hope you understand and value that number. I hope you understand the difference between, it's like having a new car as opposed to a very, very old car that's got a lot of different problems. If you've got a new car, Having a new car, having a new home, having a new something new, a new telephone, a new cell phone, doesn't guarantee you won't have technical difficulties. In this life, the reason why Simon, the man, he was a man of Cyrene, Jesus is being executed, about to be executed. He is leaving Jerusalem, the, the parts of the city, uh, the, the walled part of the city, and he's entering into its outskirts. He's leaving Jerusalem. 
He's being led up a hill called Golgotha. And he's as he's leaving the city and, and ascending this hill, up this hill, the, the Roman guards, the Roman soldiers command a bystander, Simon, to get the cross because Jesus can't apparently carry it up the hill. The, the Romans command a man named Simon of Cyrene to get the cross and to carry it as Jesus is going up this hill. For what we know, the other two men that were crucified with Jesus had to carry their own cross. But because Jesus was not only crucified, he was also brutally beaten before the crucifixion. Pilate had him brutally whipped, hoping that that would satisfy the bloodlust of the crowd, of the, of the Jewish leadership. It didn't. So Pilate would not have done both. He would not have had Jesus brutally beaten and crucified. His crime did not call for either. His crime didn't call for, uh, particularly because he was found not guilty by Pilate. So Pilate wasn't going to beat and crucify an innocent person. He was hoping that a, a beating would be sufficient. It wasn't because Satan was controlling the minds of the Jewish leadership. That's what Jesus said when he said, that this was their hour and the power of darkness. And so demon spirits were supporting the death of Jesus as they've supported no other event, no other event throughout history, it seems. So we don't know of any other event uh, that got as much attention as the death of Jesus, as that event, as it related to uh, Satan's attempt to prevent him from continuing on the earth. Satan didn't want him here anymore. Kill him because he's obviously ruining my kingdom. He got me thrown down many, many times. All right. So the Roman guardsmen, the Roman soldiers who are responsible for carrying out the execution of Jesus, they command this guy, Simon, someone who was in the vicinity to take the cross and follow Jesus up this hill. And that's an illustration of the fact that man has to participate in his deliverance, in his salvation. He's got to participate. Jesus is brutally beaten. God came down with limitations. So Jesus is the son of God. He took on the limitations of humanity. Jesus took on limitation. He is in the heart of the Father, in the bosom of the Father. This is your bosom area right here. Jesus dwells there. He left there, entered the world, and he took on the likeness of sinful flesh. He took on a body that was limited. He took on a limited body. So Jesus had a limited body, a body that could be beaten, because obviously you can't beat the eternal God. You know, it doesn't work for a billion reasons. So... He took on human flesh, which meant that he got sleepy. It meant that he got hungry. It meant that he got frustrated in ways that Almighty God doesn't get frustrated. So he took that on. Having been beaten, he is now, he is now weakened. He's, he's greatly weakened. And so he can't carry this cross up this, this hill in that condition. So the Lord... Pardon this phrase if it offends you. The Lord has taken on limitation in his ministry to man. So there are many things the Father can do that the Father does not do because he has ordained for man to get it done. So the father is invested in his sons through Christ Jesus, his only begotten. So there are things that God will not do unless he does it a specific way. And that way involves mankind. An example of that is what he said at 
the end of Ezekiel 22. He said that he sought for a man among the nations, among the nations, among the nation, um, uh, among the, the Hebrew people. Verse 30, Ezekiel twenty two thirty. And I sought for a man among them. Throughout Ezekiel 22, the Spirit of God is complaining, if, you could, if I could use that phrase. He is expressing his anger at the disobedience of the leadership, the secular leadership, the spiritual leadership, the kings, the princes, the judges, and then the prophets and the priests. He says that the prophets are not speaking the truth to the extent that people are actually repenting of their deeds. That's what he's upset about. And that's what he's talking about in Jeremiah 23. So the Lord doesn't like the version of Christianity that many people are attempting to live out. So many are attempting to live out a, a weak version of righteousness that doesn't measure up to the preaching or teaching of Jesus Christ. All right? So many are living a life of half-hearted Christianity. A life that doesn't require total surrender and total obedience to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Having been taught that that's okay by those set over them is a fundamental problem. So there are prophets and there are pastors and there are priests that are letting that are allowing the people to think that it's okay to use profanity either every now and then or regularly there are people who are teaching that it's okay to live with your girlfriend and teaching isn't just what we do verbally teaching is what we see yet overlook so when leaders see things and overlook what they see, then they are teaching that what they are seeing is okay. When a leader knows that someone in the congregation who submits to him, when a leader knows that person gets tattoos and the leader does not address that as sinful and idolatrous, then that leader is teaching that mutilating your body and creating new portals through which demons can enter is okay. When a teacher sees a person in the congregation who is openly effeminate and or homosexual, because there's a difference between being effeminate and being homosexual or perverse, sexually perverse. When leaders see those things and don't say anything against what it is that they are seeing, the leader is teaching that it is okay to be that way. When a leader knows that this person over here, it's, there are a lot of things that the, that the people are doing that they are still doing with the title of Christian believer or Jesus follower or whatever they might call themselves. And, and this is an issue because these are the very things, according to what Paul said in Ephesians 5, these are the very things, according to what Jesus said in Matthew 15, that bring the wrath of God on the children of disobedience. Uh, Paul said that we cannot continue in sin so that we can show how great God is. We, we talk, we've talked about how some, sometimes, sometimes, many times, 
people praise the greatness of God. One of the things that I've come to learn over the years is that many people praise the greatness of God and this and 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 describe man as lowly and a sinner uh, because it allows man to continue in sin while celebrating how great God is, how kind he is, how holy he is, but yet how unholy man is. So man doesn't have to be holy because man isn't God. We've heard people say, I'm not Jesus, referring to why they don't have to meet the standards Jesus has told them to meet. They don't have to follow the preaching of the word of God as it's stated. No, I don't have to conform to the image of Jesus Christ because I'm not Jesus Christ and he is awesome. I'm lowly. I'm a wretched sinner. And so many of our musicians and of our leaders have led the people astray. Bad discipleship, meaning people who aren't committed to the godly authorities that are set over them, or people who are committed to ungodly authorities, either because a person is unfaithful in their submission to the authority set over them, or because a person is being led by someone who's spiritually blind, what that's doing is it's producing a generation of lukewarm people, people who don't believe that what Jesus Christ is preaching and doing is God's standard. So what Jesus says and does are the standards of God. And I'd like to say is the standard because what Jesus says and what he does are one thing. It's a message. The Lord expects you to participate. The Lord calls us to be co-laborers. Paul said that his persecution, his imprisonment was a fulfillment of persecution Jesus didn't get to go through while he himself was here. He said there were there are some other kinds of suffering that Jesus was to go through that I am going through. And so Jesus wasn't ever rejected by his wife. So some are going to be rejected by their wives on behalf of Jesus. That's them carrying the cross of Jesus. Now, Jesus, before he was even crucified, Jesus was telling men to carry their crosses. But nobody died for themselves. Where did I get my cross from? Why, why are you referring to a cross before he, he, he even died at the cross? So everyone's cross is essentially Jesus' cross. There's only one cross, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So this water baptism is a spiritual event that, that, that opens you up to the physical death that Jesus died. Jesus physically died and physically resurrected. So when we are water baptized, the power released the forgiveness and the power released to us through Jesus' death and resurrection, through water baptism, we get that power. We get that power. Jesus physically died and physically resurrected. We are physically dipped in the water and physically brought out of the water. Being physically dipped in the water is you being physically put to death as Jesus was physically put to death. So your water baptism is a, is a spiritual transference that you got access to through Jesus' physical death. When you are water baptized and brought up again from the water, there is a power that you get from Jesus' body, bodily death and bodily resurrection. 
That stated, you have to participate in your salvation. That's why the good news is not you are saved, so don't do anything. The message is repent so that you can have this and then go do that. Well, I don't have to do that. Jesus did everything. Jesus died. Jesus resurrected. Jesus ascended. Jesus said, if you, in, 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 in John 6, the, the, the people said to Jesus, what must we do to do the works of God? We want to do his miracles. Jesus said, you have to believe. Well, what does it mean to believe? Does it mean to agree in your mind? Does it mean to accept what he's saying is true in your mind? Does it mean to embrace the information? Paul said, by grace are we saved through faith. What is grace? Grace is the power of God to you that you could not have had access to. God chooses who to release power to. That's called grace. You can't get God's power. God gives you his power. And as he's extending it to you, you receive it. I can't go to the White House for dinner. And an an invitation has to be extended. So God extends an invitation. You sense the invitation. And he, through that invitation, empowers you to say yes. Jesus said, how come you all can't hear what I'm saying? Talking to the religious leaders of his day. He said, it's because you are not my sheep. He said, my sheep hear my voice and they will not follow another voice. So what about that guy over there? Why doesn't he hear? He said that too. You can't hear my words because you are not my sheep. You can't come to me because only those who my father draws can come to me. Unless my father draws you, you will not come to me. The demons were trying to tell on who Jesus was. Jesus is, this is Jesus. Jesus said, shut up. Nobody is going to tell who I am. I am going to say things and do things. What I say and do is going to, is, what I say and do is going to impact people to the extent that my father at his choosing will let them know that this is the Messiah. Peter said, you are the Messiah. Jesus said, you didn't come to that conclusion because you heard a demon say it. You didn't come to that conclusion simply because of the words that come out of my mouth that hit your physical ears and that your natural mind processed. Jesus said, my father taught you that. There was an argument in John chapter 10. What was the argument? Many of the Jews said, why are you other Jews listening to this man? He's got a demon in him. That is obviously a demon talking through him. The response from the other group was, these are not the words of him that has a devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? That was their rep, that was their, 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 their confirmation. That was evidence. So they first responded, his word, these are not the words of a person who has a devil. And then as further proof that he's not demon possessed, he's opening the blind eyes. So let me ask you a qualifying question to your assertion that the man is demon possessed. Have you ever seen a demon open the eyes of the blind? And so they approach Jesus and say to him, how long are you going to make the nation to doubt? Tell us plainly. How did Jesus respond? I've already told you and you didn't believe. What do you mean you've already told me? I didn't hear you say that you are the Messiah, the son of God. So the natural mind will not submit to the spirit of God. It it cannot and it will not. So the Holy Spirit speaks to people according to his will, revealing the son. When Mary Magdalene saw Jesus at resurrection, she had no idea who he was. 
She had no idea who he was. Those two men on the road to Emmaus after Jesus' resurrection, questioning whether he resurrected or whether someone stole his body or what had happened, Jesus approaches them as they're having this conversation, trying to figure out what happened to his body and why the tomb was empty. Jesus approaches them and says to them, what are you guys talking about? They stare at this man having no idea who he was. They had no idea who he was. Why didn't they have any idea? The scripture literally says that their eyes were held. They were blinded. They were unable to discern this person until he decided to reveal himself. Once they got to where they were going and they were eating together, they let him do the honors of blessing the food. He took, he blessed it, broke it and gave it to them. That transaction opened their eyes, not accidentally. There was no accidental opening of the eyes of these men. It was absolutely intentional from the Father to them. Open their eyes. They realized who they were talking to, and then he's gone. Just like that. All right. We see God because God shows himself, not simply because God exists, because he hides himself according to what Isaiah prophesies. Surely you are a God who hides himself. That's what the scriptures prophesy. He reveals himself to whom he chooses. And to whom he doesn't choose to, those guys are over there, he hardens. So we preach so that Jesus reveals himself. He's revealed himself to us. Jesus said in John 3, he said in John 3, we speak what we have experienced. We speak what we've personally seen and heard. That's what John was saying in 1 John chapter 1. That which we have seen. Jesus wanted the witnesses to have personally experienced his death, resurrection, his life of ministry. Jesus wanted, Jesus wanted his representatives, his foundational primary representatives to have been with him. So Paul could not be one of those initial guys. He had to choose guys that physically saw him, physically ate with him. Not a dream, not a vision. No, they were physically there because these, were, these would be people who would have a measure of impartation, a measure of spiritual empowerment from these interactions having been shown that this is the very Christ. Power would radiate from them, exude from them. The glory of God would radiate from them, impacting people that they would speak to. It is the glory of God that's at work through evangelism. When we are evangelizing, it's not the depth it's not the eloquence of what it is that we're saying. It's not our ability. It's not apologetics. Apologetics, the explaining or the arguing of your point, if you win people through your arguments and your reasoning, then the change that's been made is not a sanctifying change. It's not an equipping change. It's not a transforming change. It's not a change that allows the individual to take up the cross Jesus carried. David doesn't die for himself. So my cross describes the ministry I have to the lost. It describes the responsibility that I have to be like Jesus because as he is, so are we in this world. We are given the Holy Spirit of God to conform to the very image of God by way of Jesus Christ. And we are receiving measures of power to conform to that image. And God determines who gets what measure. Does this guy get this measure or this measure? Does he get the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom? Or will, this, or will he be given the gift of prophecy? What about him? What does he get? Every man is giving a measure of God's power and character so as to reflect Jesus, so as to represent Jesus, so as to be changed by this ongoing, ever-growing glory of God. 
So the glory of God transforms us and makes us who we're supposed to be. So this requires participation. So grace empowers faith. What is faith? Faith is a spiritual capacity. It is a spiritual capacity. It is not a personal, natural acceptance of the truth. Faith describes the spiritual capability to hear and to believe God's voice and God's work. That's what faith is. Faith is the God-given ability that you could not have earned. So you could not have prayed for it. You wouldn't have known to pray for it. it. It's by invitation only. Go out and tell them to come in. It's by supernatural, spiritual invitation only. It is the divine gift of God. God, by his sovereign mercy, decides whether you are cement or black, rich soil. That's, that's the reality. As Jesus is preaching in, in Matthew 13, this guy is cement. This guy is superficial soil. This guy is soil with a bunch of thorns in it. And this is perfectly black, healthy, nutrient-enriched soil. Who gets to decide who is who? It is the Lord. So the Lord decides. Whether, now, the seed is the seed. The seed is the word of God. The seed is the truth of God. It's planted everywhere. This guy gets some. This guy gets some. This guy gets some. And that guy gets some. So what we produce what we produce is a manifestation of who we are, who we are. So the purpose of God is about the person of God in your life. The purpose of God is about the personhood of God. Believing on God is becoming a son of God. That's what it says in John chapter one. As many as received or accepted him to them gave he power to, be, to become the sons of God. Many are called, but few are chosen. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to those who believe on his name. What is belief? It is a description of the impact faith has on your heart and your mind. It is a description. To say you believe on God is a description of a transaction that has occurred Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and your house. What is Paul preaching in Acts 16 when he says that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved? He is saying embrace this. Now, what's he really saying, though? Is he saying accept this in your mind? Or is he speaking as Genesis chapter 1 is speaking? Let there be light. Let there be a firmament. Let there be, uh, let, the, let the waters Separate. Let the, let the dry land appear. Let the vegetation manifest. Let there be lights in the heavens. Let the, let the earth bring forth the fish and the, and, and, and the, 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 the bird. Let this happen. When, when, we, when we preach the word of God, that's a releasing of God's power. The hope is that as we are speaking the word of God, because that's the doorway, that's the vehicle through which faith comes. We speak because power is being transferred. Paul says, faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Paul says, they can't hear except there be a preacher. And they can't preach unless the spirit of God sends them. Jesus, the spirit of the Lord complains in Jeremiah. I didn't send these prophets, yet they went anyway. I did not give them dreams, yet they told dreams anyway. I didn't speak to them in their minds, yet they spoke anyway. They prophesy a vain vision. They're prophesying of their own hearts. They think things. They believe things. And they're speaking what they think. They are speaking what they believe. They're speaking what they are concluding. But they're wrong. And because of their false prophecies, the people can't do what God's expectations are for them. So now we have a whole generation of professed believers who are following the personalities of their teachers. They're following the emotional, psychological motivation and inspiration and in, motivation, inspiration, information. They're following the information and the inspiration of their leadership. That's what they're doing. They're just taking on what that individual, male or female, is saying. He said this, I'm going to apply it. 
but we are seeing very little substantial change. So then why are they continuing to go back to that person? Well, Jesus said, if a person comes in his own name, you will receive him because you are earthly. He that is of the earth is earthly and people hear them. So most people are earthly, worldly, worldly in their minds, worldly in their emotions. If you were permitted, if you are a legitimately anointed individual, actually called of God to minister to the masses, to the people, and you were permitted for six months to preach in the largest church in your area, if that church records 5,000 members, in your mind, you might think that those 5,000 would embrace the true gospel because that's what you speak. But in actuality, you would likely get a scenario that occurred in John chapter 6. This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? From that time, John 666 says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. People would stop attending that church. You know, we used to like this church, but then they started letting that guy speak. We don't go there anymore. We went to the next big church because we like this other guy. We don't go. They would not continue to go if you preach there. There's a reason why they were going there. They were going there because they wanted that garbage. They wanted that light message. They wanted that treacherous information. They wanted to feel as though they could be godly and worldly. They wanted that. And so if they let you get up there and preach and you are legitimately sent of God to bring people to repentance, well, guess what? Nobody wants to carry Jesus' cross. They don't want to carry Jesus' cross. Jesus, do it, do it himself. Jesus, you carry your own cross. Do it yourself. I'm a wicked sinner. I'm a wicked sinner. I'm hooked on this and that, and I want to do that over there. Praise you. I'll celebrate you. How about this? Praise you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. You love a wretched sinner like me. Jesus, I'm a wretched sinner. I'm a liar, Jesus. I'm, I'm double-minded, Jesus. I'm a hypocrite, Jesus. I'll praise you, though, because you're so awesome and you're so holy. Jesus, you're holy. I'm not holy. Don't expect me to be holy. Sh cover me with your holiness. Wash me in your blood. Protect me. I'm wicked. I'm going to continue to be wicked. But praise you. Praise you. Bless you. How could you love me? How could you love such a wicked one as myself? I'm so wicked. I'm so wicked. But you're so holy. How about that, Jesus? You're so holy. You are holy and I'm wicked. Don't expect me to be like you. No one is like you. No one can be like you. There'll never be another one like you in any sense. No, there'll never be. Never. You are the only one good and perfect. I will never do that. Turn the other cheek. I'll never turn the other cheek. I will never turn the other cheek. I will never sell everything and give to the poor. I would never do that, Jesus. But you are so holy because you love a wicked person like me. I will never do what you're telling me to do. No, your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails. Never. You know? And, and so you forgive me for everything. You are so powerful. You forgive me for everything. You forgive me for the stuff I, I'm going to do tomorrow. I'm going to do some bad things tomorrow. And you forgive me because your forgiveness is unchanging. Glory to God. Glory to God. He is so holy that he loves someone so wicked as I am. And so this is what we are uh, fighting through this, th these are the weeds, these are the, this is, and, and that becomes, and that's the climate for destruction. The climate for destruction. When many people 
become that way and Christianity is presented that way. No strings attached, no obligation, no obligations. This, this idea of what Jesus preached in Luke 14, counting the cost. What do you mean the cost? Are you saying that you are earning salvation? Counting the cost. There's no cost. Just believe. So when Paul talks about the marks on his back, no, that wasn't about salvation. Salvation is a description of what happens to those who are being made into the image of God and who are going to obey God because they are being conformed by the Holy Ghost into his image. If you are not being shaped into the image of God, it's because you are not saved. Now, that's what John preaches in 1 John chapter 2. In 1 John chapter 2, actually in 1 John chapter 1, he makes that very clear in his preaching. In 1 John chapter 1, he says in verse 5, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Verse 6, If we say we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness, or live lives of disobedience, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with each other, one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. What's that saying? It's saying that we still have desires to do bad things as we are overcoming them. Sometimes we make evil decisions and we are deeply convicted for it. We go back to God. We're not making excuses for it. We're not saying you're so holy, you're going to continue to let me do this. We're saying that, wow, God, I still have this body. Why don't you just deliver me from it? He says, no, you have to keep overcoming it. I'll deliver you from those levels of lust. I'll deliver you from that level of anger. I'll deliver you from that level of pride. But you'll still have to be overcoming pride. Just like you'll have to be overcoming hunger. Just like you'll have to be overcoming stinkiness sometimes when you get stinky. Just like you'll have to be overcome tooth, tooth decay and bacteria. You, well, you've got natural things to overcome. You've got spiritual things to overcome. But it's possible just with daily maintenance in the presence of God. And so it's not saying that we don't still have desires to do evil. It's saying that verse 7, if we walk in light, verse, verse 9, you've got to confess. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us, to clean us up from the damage. He can heal the damage. And he can also give you power not to be that way. Verse 10 says, if you say that you don't, uh, that you've never done anything wrong, you're a liar. Verse 1 of chapter 2. John 1 chapter 2. Don't sin. If you do sin, you've got a friend. Not a friend that's not a supporter, not an advocate, not a lawyer, not a defender who's going to let you be evil. No, he's giving you power to be righteous. He doesn't cut you off while you are striving according to what Jesus taught in Luke chapter 13. Strive. Strive. Not by human power. It, it seems like human power. It's not human power. It's the Spirit of God. It's the power of the Spirit of God that you are striving with. That's what Paul's preaching. People are trying to use Paul to reference, to, 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 to justify desperate lasciviousness and wickedness and debauchery. Verse 3. Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commands. He that says, I know him and keeps not his commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So salvation is transformation. That's what it is. Are you saved? What are you really asking? You're not asking. I hope we're not asking people, did you ever confess Jesus as Lord and Savior? Did you ever get water baptized? Confessing Jesus as Lord and Savior, confessing your sins and getting water baptized are supposed to be what happens when the Holy Spirit convinces you that you are far from God and are going to be rejected by him forever if you don't submit to his love for you by way of repentance and water baptism, positioning you for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So salvation is a description of your entry into the kingdom of God by the Spirit of God. Evidence of that is that you will begin to talk about the fact that you've been a bad person because the Holy Ghost will begin to show you that. Evidence of that is obedience to the spiritual transaction we call baptism. So baptism isn't a ritual by itself. It's not a ceremony. It's not a symbol. Baptism 
is an act of obedience that positions you to receive the transformation. So when we are taught that you can be a bad person and the Lord will still love you because he's so holy and you get baptized into that, that's another gospel. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's another gospel. Many people have been baptized into another gospel. They've been baptized into a false gospel. They've been baptized because they thought that they could still be a bad person. They could still live with their girlfriend. They could still live with their boyfriend. They could still have kids out of wedlock. Obviously, you can't take the child's life because you were a fornicator, but they believe that it's okay. They believe that they should be celebrated, accepted, embraced. They believe that, you know, going to these really, really worldly events is okay. We were in church one time and someone was talking about a really worldly event that is specifically unto a demon spirit, right? We were talking about an event and the person, the, the preacher asked the congregation if it's okay. This, in, th this was the question. In the 1930s, there was an Olympic Games uh, ceremony. Jesse Owens, an Olympic runner, decided not to compete in an event because it was on a Sunday. The question to the congregation was, was it right? Do you think it was right for Jesse Owens not to compete because he chose not to run on a Sunday? So there were responses from the congregation. The brother that I was with said, well, the Olympic Games is for the demon spirit Zeus. So he shouldn't have been a part of it in the first place. That obviously brought up a controversial response from the congregation. One person took Colossians. He grabbed the book of Colossians, a letter by the Apostle Paul beaten for Jesus. I don't think Paul knew that men were going to do this with his writings, but he got the um, book of Colossians. And let's say that he used the... Um, I, it likely he used the NIV, so I'll go to that version. Not that I have that version, but we'll go to the International Standard Version. And he read this scripture. It says right here, Colossians chapter 2, the end of it, right there. So the statement that by the person that I was with was, Hey, that festival is for false gods. He shouldn't have been participating participating as a Christian. So the guy got the guy turned to Colossians 2 and read this scripture. Therefore, let no one judge you in matters of food and drink or with respect to a festival, a new moon or Sabbath days. So nobody can judge you because you attend a festival. That's what he read. And so the congregation, they accepted that because it says that. Don't let anybody judge you because of a festival. So many are being led astray either because they're being led by bad people or because they don't like what the right person is saying and so they just don't do it. So is that a qualifying scripture? Well, what would have happened if we would have read Revelation 2, Revelation 2 when Jesus is preaching to his church and says to his church that the church that mingles with false religion will be rejected by him, cursed by him. Paul wasn't saying it's okay to go to festivals for demons and enjoy your time. Paul was saying as it relates to the keeping of the Jewish feast, you are not obligated to keep Jewish feasts to be saved. That's not a component of your salvation. That was not saying it's okay for Jesse Owens to participate in the Olympic Games unto the Olympic Pantheon or collection of demon gods.
That's not what that was saying. But that's what people will take it to say. If you preach that in a congregation of X amount of hundreds of people and they only attend because they are being taught that they are qualified before God just as they are, they've got two options, convert or leave. Or, of course, then the third option, stay there and not change. Unfortunately, the devil is trying to get people to do that, and we can't. We can't conform to that. What are we talking about? Jesus is returning for a church without spot. That's why we've got to obey. That's why we've got to pursue God. That's why we spend time in hearing the word of God, because we want the Holy Ghost to purify us. We, we know that the hearing of the word of God is transformative. It's transforming. It's conforming. It's going to make you like Jesus. Hearing the word of God, being in atmospheres where the worship of the living God is going on, abandoning information that distorts our understanding of truth. That's the will of God for your life. It's the will of God for your life that you position yourself to be transformed by the word of God, spoken by the people of God. And it is the will of God that you read the scriptures and obey what the Lord through his word is telling you to do because your obedience is also a transforming work. When you do what God tells you to do, Jesus said that he will make you free. He's going to free you from lust and anger and rebellion and idolatry. He's going to make you free. If he makes you free, he's going to save you in the end. That's what Peter preached. Peter said, you're going to receive the end of your faith, the end of this journey of faith, the salvation of your souls. So we've got to press in. We've got to lay down our lives every day. And we want to know, we want power from God to do that because the rewards for that in this life and in the life to come are irreplaceable beyond anything we could ever fathom. Eyes haven't seen it, ears haven't heard it, neither has it entered into the hearts of men, the things God prepared for those who wait for him, things he's prepared for those who love him, but he reveals those things to us. How does he do it? By his spirit. So you can read Revelation and hear all of the good things that God has for you and yet not obey. You can read Revelation, hear about what God has for you, and still disobey because those rewards haven't appealed to your spirit. Or you could read Revelation and get so excited at who God is going to promote you to be. You could get so excited at these mansions, so excited at this Crystal River, so excited about this city and say, I'm never going back. What empowers you to do that? the grace of God, the, the spirit of God, the anointing of God. So we work because of the transforming power of the Holy Ghost. We've got to carry Jesus' cross. So the cross that we're carrying, it's the cross of Jesus given to those who have to participate. No, I didn't sin. You sinned. You got to participate. You've got to participate. So come on. I'm going to give you power to do it. I'm going to be the actual one who dies. But you've got to participate. You've got to carry that, carry that for me. Yeah, you're the reason why I had to die anyway. It's the will of God, brothers. This is your brother David Williams with Jesus Ministries. God willing, we will talk within the next 24 hours. Our information is or will be below this video.